All right, quick reminder, everybody. If you're into firearms, firearms training, and firearms-related gear, and you haven't checked out the Vortex Edge podcast, you better go do it. You got Jim, who you're probably familiar with from the Vortex Nation podcast, hosting it. He's teamed up with the professional instructors over at Vortex Edge. It's tons of great content. Give it a watch on the Vortex Edge YouTube channel. Give it a listen on any of the major podcast platforms. You'll be a better shooter for it. And it's probably the most innocuous piece of gear on the table, but I find this to be ridiculously useful. So I have a love-hate relationship with slings. I think they're very important um, because sometimes you need to carry your rifle not in your hands. All right, what is up, everybody? For reference, we are in the month of January. So no matter when you're listening... We're living in the month of January right now. Got a dream team together. Got uh, some of my best friends at Vortex here just ready to talk about some really great stuff. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see some of this great stuff on the table. Now, the calendar page has turned. We've, we've, we're, we're into the new year. Now, a lot, of, a lot of the new year, we look forward. You know, like, what are we going to do? Let's look forward. You know, the previous year is in the rearview mirror. It's time to look ahead. That's true in some ways, but also not true because the context of this podcast is a gear in review. We've removed the why, a little play on words there, of year in review. This is gear in review. We're taking a look back at some of our gear set that we used, new stuff that we maybe haven't used before, how it worked, or actually, you know, these are all things that we liked, right? And uh, they're going to help us move forward. With, uh, you with replaced year with gear? Yeah, you like that? No, I love that. That's pretty, awesome. Pretty clever. Yep. Tongue in cheek. Just one letter. Very good. Uh, so this is really cool. I'm liking what everybody brought to the table. We brought a lot of cool stuff to the table here. I should mention, since I mentioned we have a, a full house here, got Eric Barber to my right, Mr. Ryan Muckenhern across from us. We've got him, everybody. We got the niece again, Mr. Paul Niece and Sawyer Brill, <laughs> waving to the camera. So, uh, you know, I'm just going to start, uh, I guess, straight away. Or anybody else have anything? It's kind of a long intro, so. I think it's a good intro, Mark. Mm -hmm. I'm excited it, for it. Uh, we were trying to figure out how to name this summit. Yeah. Eric proposed Mount Rushmore. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> now we know. Bunch yeah. of distinguished gentlemen. <laughs> I, I feel honored. Forged yeah, in rock. Yeah, I feel honored. Yep. Forged in the rock of the mountain. Uh, Sawyer, what do you got What do you got for us today? What, uh, what did you use this past hunting season that you're like, you know what? This is uh, something we got to talk about. Full disclosure, I completely misread your email. I thought it was only one piece of kit, same. so I'm going to talk. Yep, same. me and Muck are in the same boat here. So I'm going to talk about the stick, the trekking poles I have here, and then a couple other things I really like. So one thing I really like are the Guidex trekking poles from Argali. So carbon upper, aluminum on the lower. Uh, I think these are about, yep. Both combined, 17 ounces. They go down to 25 inches collapsed, so super packable if you're not going to be using them the whole time. What I really like about these, one, just the ergonomics. I really, really like the grip. And the other interesting thing they've done with these is quarter 20 in the top. So you can pop this out, and then they have an adapter that you can um, use with a Vortex tripod adapter for your binos. So nice stability for glassing. Um, there's also an adapter that you can put in the middle to attach to tent pole. So really, really, really cool piece of kit. I was not a huge trekking pole guy, uh, but we went on that trip in August uh, to Alaska and I just absolutely fell in love with these to the point that I was using them when I didn't even need to be using them. I kind of just got used to using them. I really liked how they felt in my hand. Uh, really cool piece of product. And if you use a camera, obviously that quarter 20, you can use it for that as well. Um, so just a, a really, really nice piece of gear that I have really enjoyed using. Um, and I think at the time of this podcast, these are, these are brand new. So you can go and get these now on the Argali website. Um, they have all the accessories there too. Like I said, it's going to work with a Vortex tripod adapter, anything quarter 20, um, going to work there as well. Just super multifunctional, which I really like and appreciated in particular in Alaska. Anytime I can bring less stuff or stuff can serve dual purpose. Big fan of that personally. Um, and I'll also be using it around here. Like we do some trips to like Bayfield where we'll stay in a yurt and it's like two miles up vert on like old 
not even logging roads. So they'll be getting used out of season two, which always factors into me purchasing something. I really like that. Uh, one thing I don't have shown, and I think Eric's going to talk about turkey season a little bit, but I am I have become team backpack. Previously was team vest. Um, I have made the full transition. So the Eberly stock bandit pack. Really, 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 really love that pack for turkey hunting. It's like the perfect size for me for what I want to put in there. And it's got that clip on kind of molly on the back too. So if you are lucky enough to shoot a turkey, you can finagle it up in that, put it right on your pack, walk out. Really, really, really good pack. I love that pack. I use it for travel too, but uh, again, multifunctional. Knowing I'm going to use it in hunting season, but then all year round is important to me in my uh, purchasing decisions. So those are those are my two. The other quick one is the Instinct Solar uh, watch from Garmin. Love this thing. Again, use it while hunting, but throughout the year, working out, going on walks, stuff like that. Really easy to use with the app. I really like that as well. So those are my three. I like it. Nice. I'm going to take a peek at one of those. Yeah, it's, they're they're mm-hmm. awesome. I haven't uh, I haven't used that exact trekking pole yet, but uh, big trekking pole guy, mm-hmm. and yeah. uh, they are they're life changing. I don't like going on hunts without them. Like I'll do I'll do my whitetail hunting around here without them. There's probably actually times that I wish I had them, and actually there's there's a few hunts that I will I, I shouldn't say that because I do bring them sometimes. It just depends on the hunt, but there's definitely a few where if I find that I'm going to be back in maybe a couple miles and there's a likelihood of, you know, packing a buck out, I'll, I'll huck the old trekking poles in. It's one of those things for me, too, there's almost no excuse not to bring it. Like, 25 inches collapse and 17 ounces, like, you're not you're not going to notice that unless you're, like, really counting grams. But, yeah. like, there's no reason not to bring them. I, well, just, and, I really, and like, really said, like them. Most of the time on a backpacking hunt, they're out anyway. Mm-hmm. Like, they're, they're out more mm-hmm. than they're in. And obviously, a good litmus test anytime you go to Alaska and something works well and comes back intact, you're yeah. like, oh, yeah, that's a pretty good product. Yeah. 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 It's, that's definitely a must have piece of gear for me. And then, you know, so you talk about Alaska. And the nice thing about trekking poles is if you're taking a gun case, they lie like right alongside the rifle. They take up no extra space, you know, a few more ounces of weight. But, you know, and then like you pointed out, Mark, when when you're in the field and you're hoofing with them, I mean, the 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 gain that you get back in in additional climbing ability more than makes up for oh. that little bit of extra weight. Yeah, and yeah, they're a no brainer. That was the thing that probably surprised me the most being somebody that had never really used trekking poles before. But like Sawyer mentioned in Alaska, using these things, I mean, it it was. I kind of brought trekking poles on that hunt because it was on a gear list and recommended by people that I'd know have done that hunt successfully. So I'm like, yeah, I'm going to trust their opinion on it. But I didn't really go into that like with strong feelings about them. But it was all of, you know, a quarter mile into the first hike knowing that, okay, this was something that I definitely needed to have. And playing around with different like extended, you know, or, or compacted lengths, depending if you're going mm-hmm. up versus yeah. going down, yeah. it was unbelievable to me the difference in how efficient I was able to climb mm-hmm. yeah. versus not having those things. Yeah. Well, just like going that, up. I mean, like going up, like you said, it, it gains your power going Definitely. up. Definitely. And then if you come downhill with a good load on your back, having that extra bracing just to kind of support you when you yep. get off balance yep. a little bit, it's it's almost more huge than, than yeah. the gain going uphill. That 100% you get agree. Them, so. And yep. I, was, I was reading an article somewhere. I don't know if this is true data or not, but they had essentially put together a formula for if you have trekking poles at the correct height and you're using them, how much weight it takes off um, of yeah. based on what you have in your pack. Like it feels like X pounds less. Uh, yeah. Interesting. I forget yeah. what it was, but I do remember yeah. talking about that beforehand that it makes it feel like you're pa- it, like 25 or 50% perceived le- mm-hmm. less pack weight. I don't remember mm-hmm. what it was, but I remember seeing that too. Mentally, mentally too, like it's just another thing in my brain that gives me, whether it's real or not, a little more confidence too. Like, I just feel safer when I'm using them. I don't really know why. Oh, um, well, it's because you're connected to the earth when right. you otherwise wouldn't <laughs> right. be. Like, four, four-wheel yeah. drive is yeah. better than yeah. two-wheel drive, yeah. you know? Mark, I'm not going to spill the beans on yours, but quarter 20, you could also I thread in an axe. Just you can put an axe in there. Put the whippet on there. So if you're really in a pickle, hey. Hit him on the head. <laughs> yep. we, were, we were in one spot where I was actually, I was thinking about this over the weekend. And, uh, yeah, I... When we were on that hunt, I wished I had had taken the time to to get that out. I'm going to quit uh, also clicking this trekking pole uh, <laughs> into the microphone. But I will say, actually, I want to talk about that because I've had some trekking poles with um, 
without the audible click. Well, no, but just like the way it lever locked was at least appeared definitely and through breaking it, you know, more fragile than this. And this looks pretty robust. When we were looking at these earlier, I was like, oh, I, that seems like a high quality yeah, lever lock. That's what I was looking at, too. It's just a nice, firm, secure, you know, it it latches in there. I, yeah. had, a, I had a different pair one time where it was like first use and I was tightening it down. It's like, oh, is this modular? Oh, no, yeah. it's broken. I like that distinction there, Mark. Through breaking it, I determined, in fact, mm-hmm. it wasn't. <laughs> it was no good. Yeah, these things are field tested. They did it. They got the check mark in my book. That's awesome. Well, Paul, we'll we'll, we'll talk about what, or did anybody else have anything to add? To Sawyer's, that, uh, that Garmin watch is actually, so I have the same one, and that was my first year using a watch like that, and mm-hmm. I've really, really enjoyed it. I was really uh, intimidated by it at first. I was like, God, I'm not going to need all this stuff. But then you look at what you can, what it can do like while you're sleeping and like all this stuff, it's like I end up using all of it. The app is like the most addicting part of that. Like it, from a yeah. workout mm-hmm. standpoint, like you said, tracking your sleep, like mm-hmm. it, it gives you a... Yeah, you know, I was under the weather first week of December and I went in and looked at my sleep score on the app and it was like way, way down. And I noticed that actually before I got sick. I'm like, God, this is weird. Like, I still feel like I'm getting my, you know, seven hours that I usually get every night. But the quality of my sleep was way, way down. I'm like, I wonder if this is writing on the wall. A day and a half later, I'm feeling under the weather. No kidding, So, yeah. You're like, you can be like predictively, it's like. Seriously, it is. the, The app is equally, if not more cool and insightful than than the actual watch itself like the, the watch is awesome the app is like that's where the difference comes you'd be like i can get in a cold and I'll be like oh you look and sound fine like i yeah, know my watch told me yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like when you google your <laughs> symptoms yeah. yeah yeah oh also one caveat for any of the haters on the internet that are like these look brand new you didn't use them they are brand new. The pair I used in Alaska. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the pair I used in Alaska, in Alaska went to Sheep Show. So there I you do go. not have those back uh. yet. So I had to call in a favor to make sure I had some to be on camera here. There you go. Very that is nice. why they are unblemished. I nice. yeah. wanted to caveat that. They did look quite clean. Mm-hmm. I thought maybe you had gone through and scrubbed them up a little nope. bit. No, the others look very unclean. Very appropriate product for the sheep show. Yes. Yep, yeah. Definitely. That's, they had to make the. They had to get in the crate. I wonder if you could uh. have fixed some sort of spear to that. Oh, I think you could. Probably. They're they're good for poking snakes sometimes. Are they? Yeah. I oh, tried yeah. catching a rattlesnake one time with my shooting sticks, but it was just a little fella, and he ended up getting away. I was. <laughs> if I had these poles, I'd have caught him. Story for another time. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. Right. Come back you next go week. Go for a long time on trekking poles. Oh, one thing I didn't mention, too, uh, you can use it as a shooting stick. They have an attachment yeah. for shooting mm-hmm. sticks. Does it yeah. come in the box? Yeah. Uh, no. Okay, so an no. auxiliary attachment. Yep. It just turns them into a little v yoke. It's mm-hmm. got like a V-notch on yeah. the top. Yeah. Very cool. Yep. Very cool. When we uh, were in Alaska, so so I'm a big proponent of just shooting, and sti- shooting sticks in general, and I use them on a variety of hunts, but my plan on that one was to be like, yeah, I'll just use my trekking poles. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Paul. You look as right. as you like to do in the mountains. You're running lean and mean, but yeah, I'm gonna. I think I'm so. Well, I did. I did. I did actually bring three pieces here. Well, that's Those, what I mean. You'd yep. never See, guess. There's three things it. right there. Yeah. So I'll jump right off <coughs> of uh, Sawyer's watch. There. This is the Garmin InReach Mini, which probably many of your listeners are familiar with. I've used. I'm kind of a slow adapter of technology, so I tend to use a stuff and then slowly upgrade it. But I don't usually leap into the latest and greatest things right away. So these have been out for a while. It's 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 nothing new, but this particular one is new for me because I've used the the earlier the Explorers, which is a bigger. It has it has the satellite capability, the SOS. It's built. There's a you know there's a um, GPS feature in it. But, you know, what I've realized over time is I, I don't go anywhere without my phone these days. You know, the phone is just always with me, and I tend to always download maps into that phone. So I found the the GPS stuff. I just don't really need a standalone GPS anymore. And, uh, you know, just in the interest of being a guy that likes to hunt in the mountains, counting ounces, the thing is pretty big and bulky. So this really, it's a nice upgrade. It's small. It's light. Um, people are probably familiar generally to use this. It's best used with a phone app, but again, phone's always there. Uh, with the app, it's very easy to type out messages and so forth. Um, anybody that hunts solo, you know, it really, it's kind of a must have piece of gear, whether you have the mini or one of the larger, older ones that I was talking about. But I used to hunt years and years without one of these things and then just finally 
kind of realization when you're out by yourself there's just too many things that can go wrong and it's an easy piece of gear to carry um i do a lot of motorcycling as well i ride a, a adventure style bike so these things if you're out you can clip it to your jacket it's just a nice if you get pitched off the bike and it ends up on top of you in a ditch someplace mm. another place where this thing is a really good piece of gear to have um we were talking about Alaska. I mean, they're, uh, in reach is kind of a must-have piece of gear in Alaska. It just is. You know, you have the ability to quickly hit an SOS and have somebody come looking for you. Um, they're doing that in some of the phones now, the iPhones, for example, which is pretty cool. But, the, you know, the one thing that this does that, a, that an iPhone still won't do is you, you can carry on a text conversation. And, the, you know, the iPhones right now, it's just an emergency SOS. So that'll probably evolve as time goes by, and they may, you know, put these out of, out of business at right. one point. But To your point, Paul, it, too, uh, do you, do you want to be the guy to test out the first iPhone that has the SOS it's, button? Well, it's like, happened. It's, oh, really? You've they're used a, it on there? No, I, ha- I oh. have not. I ha- mine is an older iPhone, so it doesn't have that mm-hmm. feature. Um, but there have been a couple publicized yeah. incidents already where people have been saved themselves with huh. an iPhone. So it Crazy. does it does work. Um, InReach uses the Iridium satellite network, which is really the, it's, I think, regarded as about the best one out there. I know I've never failed to um, get contact in Alaska and any other remote place in the lower 48 I've been. So pretty much tried and true. I think most of you guys probably already use those too. Um, I even, going off that too, Paul, like even just for local stuff, you know, like I got my first inReach here, I guess, at the start of the year before we went to Alaska. And since then, you know, like hunting whitetails at home, just in, you know, areas where, you know, you've got like some of the hill country in the southwest part of the state. A lot of times you don't have service in those bottoms. And I've always like guy falls out of a tree stand. What do you do? And that's, uh, you know, like you said, put it on your bino harness and you've got it there and you're set. Well, it does, yeah, and, and and you're right. You know, I didn't mention that. I mean, there are places even in the lower 48 yeah. where it's just it's a pretty handy way to communicate with a hunting partner, definitely. or base mm-hmm. camp or something, even if you're not in the most remote country in the world. But definitely, cell phones don't work everywhere. So, right. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah. such a, I'd say most of the places I hunt in Wisconsin, I actually don't have cell, cell service. It yeah. seems like mm-hmm. it seems like you would have it, but but you really don't oftentimes. So yeah. Yeah, I do the same thing, Eric. I keep it. For me, like I need to keep something like that in the same place, like all the time. So, mm-hmm. like my like, and everybody's gonna have their place where they keep it, but I keep it out where I can get to it. And for me, that that's my bino harness. Yeah. It's right here. Yeah. I can see yeah. it. I can reach yep. it. If I'm, you know, who knows? You fall out of the tree stand, or maybe you're pinned by something. Having yeah. it h- here mm-hmm. means you can get to it, right? Yeah. Or yep. hope, hopefully, you know, high yep. high odds versus mm-hmm. like, oh, I'm gonna go it's get in my, into my backpack, backpack. Yeah. and I fell yeah. out of the tree, and the backpack is in the tree, right. like. Mm-hmm. Perfect example. There you go. Yep. And and you know, and for the listeners, these things basically they work. You you have to get a subscription to a mm-hmm. satellite service. Um, they have kind of tiered subscription levels, so you don't really have to spend a lot of money. Mm-hmm. I usually, you know, I just kind of have primarily have it for emergency stuff. So I I use the most basic program they mm-hmm. have, and I think it's like fifteen dollars a month. Yep. And a, there's a twenty five dollar annual fee. It's not wildly expensive. Right. And the other kind of cool thing about those subscriptions is, is that you can pause them too. Mm-hmm. So you can typically I'll have mine enabled, you know, maybe three, four months at a time. Sure. And in the winter time here when I'm not out in the field someplace, it's disconnected and I'm not Definitely. paying for it. So yeah, yep. it works really well. I know the one, at least at the time, and I probably need to revisit it, but the subscription I got was like the basic one, but like I was looking at some price options. And so I got like the basic one, but like an annual 12 month one. And also like knowing me and my personality, I'm like, I'm just going to get it. So I know when I go hunting, I have it. And yeah, it's, it's you know, the 11 to 15 bucks a month or whatever it yeah. is, but like, yeah. I know I have it. And then I was, I was trying, at least at the time, like maybe some of their packages have changed or will change, you know, yeah, so like, no, it's I'm like, sure. um, but like the money differential from being able to like customize it, I'm like, forget it. I'm just gonna get it. Did you Definitely. take? Did you take a look at the top tier package? No, I can't remember what the the monthly fee is, but what it affords you. You push the button. There's like a a tactical aircraft that comes and gets you, and it has a like fully staffed med kit on board or like a personnel, and then they fly you to any hospital in the world you want so that was well, that sounds delightful that was the biggest yeah. Yeah. like um oh crap this is real when when i signed up for like the inreach you know subscription there's like a uh something like what you're talking about yeah. ryan where right at the end there's like you can pay 15 bucks for like an insurance policy mm-hmm. 
Whereas, yeah. like, if you accidentally hit the SOS or something like that, I forget what it was, but it actually, like, it's it's like insurance <laughs> for you. So you don't have to pay for that expense. It, exactly. Helicopter flight and they break, out there. They break yeah. down what, like, a Coast Guard, like, evac is. And <laughs> yeah. I'm like, okay, I'm going to pay the extra whatever it is. <laughs> oh, yeah. you know? oh, I 100% yeah. buy that. Yeah, yeah. yeah that was, that yeah. was easy. I, I, I paid it forward on that one as yeah. well. I was, I was like, this will be money well spent. Yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah. And even, even if it's, you know, if it's for cause, if you did break your leg or something, um, many, you know, you you may still have to pay for that yeah. med flight that comes in to get you. So Definitely, that insurance is whether it was a you know a call that wasn't really needed or needed either way. Right. You're you're covered that. Yep. Yeah, I, I didn't I didn't want to have to make uh, another call, uh, sweetie. Yeah, the good news is uh, we saved you know forty dollars or whatever it is. <laughs> The bad news is, is we owe some money now too. Yeah. <laughs> Let me tell you what the evac costs. Yeah. 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 Yep. I'm sure her first question would be, "Are you okay?" Yeah, definitely. All uh, right, we'll retire that one. I'm going to just touch piece of apparel. I've used these off and on the last couple of years. I, you know, by the time this hunting season came around, I'm an absolute believer. If it's a cool hunt in any way, shape, or form, these come along every single time. Yep. It's almost become one of my most basic go-to underlayers and that that is these these long johns that have zippers and you can take off definitely you know i they've been around for a while again i'm not sharing anything brand new out there i can tell you if you don't have them it's something you will absolutely be glad if you get Mm -hmm. Um, any type of mountain hunting you know you're usually it's cold in the morning you're exercising but you're always changing in and out of gear constantly yep. and, and that that you know the primary thing with these things is, is you don't have to undo your boots to take them off yep. and it's you know it's just growing on me what a huge plus that is and again ties into the same motorcycling thing for me i'm many times wearing long johns motorcycling yeah. big heavy boots on just not having to do it, it it's huge and it's, it's just funny how these things have really become such a, yeah. you know, an important piece of gear. And there are many, de- you know, these are Kuyu's, but First Light makes them, King's Camo. There are probably yeah. half a dozen companies that do them. And varying weights, I tend to like the really thin stuff because I find that usually is the most useful, valuable. It's something, you know, you can be pretty active and still use it. Yep. But nevertheless, the time comes, you know, you're climbing, climbing for hours, you're starting to sweat, and the stuff's got to come off before you get wet. Definitely. So, but to me, it's a huge thing. Yeah. yeah. It just, you know, seems like such a funny basic piece of gear, but, you know, it's it's always high on my list now. I was so skeptical about zip-off long johns. Like, from a, it took me quite a while, too. Yeah. Yeah. My, my biggest hang-up was I w- wasn't sure how I was going to f- like physically feel with that zipper running up yep. the side. Mm-hmm. Yep. You don't notice it at all, but... W- not you know to build off what you mentioned there, Paul. Even for you know tree stand hunting whitetails back home, a lot I found myself throwing those in the backpack and you know hiking up the hill with those off. And then once I get set up, because you're you know you're sweating and everything, and I actually run a uh, three quarter length versus like the right, full length, right? And yep. I like that just because. You know, one, some of these side zips don't go all the way down. And there, there's even ways there's, a, I watched a video, I forget, I, it was like a first light video or some, something where they were actually able to get them on without even undoing their, uh, the, the waist part of their pants. Oh, no kidding, huh? Um, you know, if you, That's pretty good. That yeah, sounds like magic. Yeah. yeah if <laughs> you got to get real good at it to do it that way. I am not at that level, Practice. but I've seen that. That is, that is yeah. a thing. The other so, thing I really we'll like, have, too. Uh, we'll have Rick's video uh, up here next well, demonstrating this. Might might have to try that. He takes his long underwear off without taking his pants off. <laughs> Can't be done. <laughs> <laughs> oh, voila. Yeah. Oh, these old things. <laughs> now pick a yeah. card. Yeah. yeah. The thing I really yeah. like, too, with those is when you do need to take them off, if they're wet, they I found they just dry so much faster when you can zip them all the way and do the kind of the butterfly Make thing. Make a big flag Versus out just of them. a closed yeah, pant. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd say I generally lean towards a lighter long john just because of the versatility. And part of that, though, is because I, I don't have a zip off set. And I, actually, I really like the ones that I have. But um, sometimes I won't put them on because I know I might have to take them off. Like I'll, like, I'll get out a little bit of cold until it warms up, you know, or whatever. Uh, and then uh, And then I like the lighter ones because, like, you have like a little bit more range of yeah. com- you're, you're not, comfort, you're, you know, when you yeah. do get a little bit hot or whatever. But um, I haven't tried the zip off ones yet. 
Game changer. No, it is, it, is, it is funny. And my concerns were the same as yours. I always felt, ah, you know, that zipper's going to bug me at some point. Yep. It's going to rub. It's gonna, you're going to get a hot spot. It's, mm-hmm. you know, it's Nobody just, likes zipper burn. I've never, you know, never felt that was an issue. Yeah. You know, maybe yep. you can, depending on you wear it over, under your sock, whatever you do. But it doesn't seem, they seem to do a pretty good job of hiding the zipper and For you know, sure. making it, you know, fairly comfortable. So, yeah. Yeah, you yep. don't notice that at all, huh, really? Or? No, I don't. I don't. Oh, look at these things. Paul, do you mind? No. Uh, and <laughs> do you mind if I touch your underpants, they're, Paul? They're, uh, they're cleaned at the end of the season, Mark, so no worries about uh, washed in skid mountain. marks hiding in there. And yeah. yeah. Washed in mountain <laughs> streams. <laughs> Would you look at that? They really are marvelous. I have the same pair. I was a little, um, I didn't really know how I felt about the like mid-calf, where they end up. Because at first when I got them, I'm like, okay, everything's, I was like, wait a minute, these things are like, Eight inches too a little, short. A little odd at first, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I'm, and I'm yeah. like, oh, wow, that's going to be interesting. Yeah, right? And um, then I just pull my sock up, normally high, and then they just sit over the sock, and yep. then my boot, like the cuff of my boot comes right to the bottom. And then, then you never notice the height no. at all after no. that. Yeah, I yep. prefer a longer sock. Yeah. So like yep. those like three-quarter three quarter ones, like they don't, like I, I, depending on the day, I'll wear the three-quarters or the full ones, yeah. but um, they both work good. Definitely. No, I, I took them off without having to take my boots off in Wyoming this year. It was quite nice. Zip. It is. Oh, yeah. yeah Did you I, just feel completely liberated at that moment? It was, it, was, it was a very cold morning, and then it turned into a very pleasant afternoon, and the very cold morning um, was quashed by the zip mm-hmm. off. And then I was back in the fight in seconds. Yeah, I suspect, Mark, you you run them for a while, you'll become a believer, too, I think. I it, might uh, have to. Yeah. That, this is why yeah. podcasts like this are fun, though, because you kind of dive into everybody's little, you know, gear set. This, you're like, yeah. oh, oh, yeah, you yeah. know, get yep. that one thing that you're like, hey, I'll probably take that away. Yep. I'm going to mention one last thing here, and, and I have to apologize. I grabbed the wrong case here, so the you and the uh, viewers will have to use your imagination. So this kind of goes along with the in-reach and the fact that I'm an older guy now. And you guys may not quite be there that you will be, I guarantee it. You'll start to need reading glasses to see stuff. And if I'm looking at it, you know, this particular very tiny screen on this thing. So what's out there, and they look just like this, unfortunately, so use your imagination. And these these come from the fly fishing world, Mark. You you may know what I'm going to say. But you can buy fly fishing sunglasses that have a really nice, just a little subset of a magnifier lens on them. Oh, right, yeah. And it, you know, to me... I reading glasses are one of my most hated things. I hate them. I don't like carrying them. I don't like shooting with them. I don't like shooting a bow with them, a rifle, handgun, anything. But when it comes to reading tiny things, you just there's times you have to have them. Maybe yeah. maybe it's a map. Sometimes you know, depending on the rifle scope I'm shooting, it may be one of the smaller turrets, and I'm trying to dial a turret, and I have to read the the numbers on the turret. So that, and I usually do have sunglasses with me. It's kind of a funny thing. You think, well, you don't, you know, you don't want to wear carry reading glasses, but you carry. But the sunglasses do a different job. They're, you know, you're out in the sunshine. They're protecting your eye. They might protect you while you're shooting. But that combination of having sunglasses with a little magnifier lens in them, the guys that have the need to wear reading glasses, trust me, you will appreciate it. It's a very, very valuable piece of gear. Inexpensive, but it's an absolute lifesaver. Like the reading glasses, stay home. Yeah, you've got the sunglasses. Tip, it's no just kidding. a any fly fishing place will carry them. I'm sure Amazon's mm-hmm. full of them, all yeah. different kinds of brands. But I'm telling you what, it's another one of those things you might not think about but when you get to the point of needing reading glasses. Yeah. Remember it; it's mm-hmm. a good, good thing. That is that. That's a good call. I'm not there yet. Fingers crossed, right? But uh, and I think in the, like the fly fishing world. You know, like I think a lot of that comes down to like knot tying. You've That's got some what I was super, it is. Oh yeah, guys are trying to they're trying to thread and, a you yeah. Know. yeah. My dad does the same thing for for fishing. You know, he's always got his readers with him just for that for knot tying. I mean, he he yeah. is not functional without them. You know. Yeah, and then the nice thing fishing, of course, is guys can do the polarized lens right. for the you know ability to see in the water. Still have the magnifier. Sure. It's it's kind of get it all in one piece. Yeah. So I'm, hmm. I guarantee it's a nice piece of gear to to have. Good call, Paul. I yeah. like it. I like it. I'm on a sunglasses quest now after I had a mule deer hunt um, in a very cold environment. It was also very snowy and very bright. And so I, would, I had to wear sunglasses, and I usually do in the field anyway. But they keep fogging up, and I'm sitting here mm-hmm. going, "This, I just hate this because like, I'd fog up if I was hunting with my back to the wind or if I was like glassing with the wind at my back. 
I'd exhale and then my glasses would fog up, yeah. drive me nuts. Yeah. Take my glasses off. Well, now I'm snow blind, so I put my glasses back on. And then I remember when I used to do a lot of snowmobiling, you know, we wear goggles and they never fog. And so I'm looking for a sunglass that has a goggle component to it, if you will, or some little press fit on the orbit of my eye, but not one that sticks so far off my face that I can't use my binoculars. Hmm. If our buddy uh, yeah. Todd Graff is listening, please weigh in with the sun with the eyewear that he uses. It's mm-hmm. very similar to what you're describing. So he, I, he's a glasses wearer yep. and and bow hunts with them. Yep. And he I don't know what the the model is or the make or anything, but he specifically has sought something out like this. I have an idea of what I want. I'm super lens color specific, yep. and then I want polarized as well. Yep. But it's the kickoff off the face that is the the part that I, like mm-hmm. the, sure. the most hinges on is can I put my binos up to my glasses and still glass with them without having to take them off? Yep. Um, so that that'll be next year's uh, gear and review item, maybe foreshadowing. Lock it in. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I can't. Uh, useful. I find it highly difficult to glass with sunglasses on. I have to take my glasses off. But it's, all, it's all about the wrap and how far yeah. it, it comes off yeah. your face. Yeah. yeah. I will say for, I think these would work for, to prevent fogging. I don't know if they make them anymore, but uh, I had a set, then I lost them, uh, a set of bolas, and yeah. they had like a, almost like a foam removable mm-hmm. insert on the back end of the eyeglasses, so it almost made it like a miniature ski goggle, which would make sense because they make a lot of ski goggles, right? right? right. But um, it was great for like uh, like ATV type stuff or sure. like dusty environments from keeping the dust from like coming in behind your glasses. Mm-hmm. And then um, I'm not sure I really tested them in cold weather to see if they like didn't fog up. You know, I don't know. That's interesting. Yeah, I'd be curious to see if those are still out there someplace. It seems like a really good idea that... Yeah, anyway, something to look into. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. My turn? Please. Okay, again, I didn't understand the assignment. I thought we were supposed to bring a piece of gear, which wasn't untrue, but Mark said apparently many, any pieces of gear. Uh, today I brought the new FHF sling, and it's probably the most innocuous piece of gear on the table, but I find this to be ridiculously useful. So I have a love-hate relationship with slings. I think they're very important. Um, because sometimes you need to carry your rifle not in your hands. Uh, for the most part, most of the hunting I do these days for big game is west, and so I also have a pack with me. And so a sling and a pack don't go well together, and so you'd rely on something like a, a gun carrier or a gun bearer or whatever they want to call them, <clears throat> where we're at the top end of the rifle. I also didn't bring a pack to demonstrate this. I just feel like a total dunce. Would you like to use this backpack? Do you have the top part? I don't. Okay. Well, then I've, I've nullified both both points here. But but you can imagine. Yeah, you could imagine like. if, if you did. Um, so you can attach the rifle to some upper component of the pack, and then it's retained at the bottom with like one of these gun carriers or gun bearers, whatever you want to call them. Um, but they're not really fast. Like if you need to unsling, depending on how it's done, that could be quick, but reslinging can be very slow or the inverse. Uh, and so then this thing dropped this year and I was looking at what they were doing. I thought that is intelligent. So on the surface, it looks like a regular rifle sling, but at the top, there's a very uh, robust female buckle uh, and then a correspondent male buckle on a strap. That male buckle and strap attaches to your pack some way. They're, they've got a whole bunch of fitment guides on FHF's web, website where you can see this done, how to do it, and if you're running a specific pack where it is best anchored. I found a spot on my pack that works really good for me. So I have the male buckle attached to my pack frame uh, for intents and purposes. And then when I want to sling this up and, and anchor it to it, I, th- I throw it over my shoulder like a regular string, sling. I reach up. I grab the male buckle, I grab the sling component, I connect the two. Now, all the load bearing is taken up by my pack. I don't have the sling on me anymore. It doesn't slide off my shoulder. I'm not, I'm not fighting for some sort of real estate between my, like my pack um, shoulder strap and then the sling itself. It's up and out of the way. And then if I need to access it, I just reach up and unclip the buckle. And then now I have control of, of, the, uh, of the rifle itself and the sling. It also works really damn good as a regular sling. Rick and I went deer hunting the other day. This was on my rifle. I didn't have my pack. It just was a sling at that point in time. Um, it's somewhat modular, too. I have their little cartridge carrier uh, on there, which I thought was a neat treat uh, hmm. to have on there. So I have a couple of cartridges in there. Um, 
gone are the days which I would bring like four boxes of ammo with on a hunt. I usually bring like mm-hmm. a magazine and then a handful of spares, and that has three cartridges in there. And if I need to expel more than that, then I'm probably having a rough day. Uh, I've been there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> couldn't, I, couldn't be me but i think a really really intelligent and intuitive piece of equipment that that addresses both issues you need the functionality and simplicity of a sling you want the load bearing capability and the hands-free option where you don't have to fight that sling when it's on your back uh, as you would like a gun bearer or a gun gun carrier of some kind um super intuitive to use super fast to use uh, and it's up and out of the way when I don't want it, and it's at the ready when I need it. Mm-hmm. I, I'm just floored by how easy this was um, and how actually effective it was. Uh, another piece of equipment that I didn't bring, also from FHF gear because I didn't read the assignment notes correctly, is their new TAC Mountain Rifle Rest, which, looking at it, it it's so simple. It's like one of those products where you, th- you think, it's like, why didn't I think of that? Like, okay, this is too easy. Um, so I usually have a tripod with me, whether I'm tripod glassing with binoculars or with a spotting scope. And for many years, I've run a shooting rest on top of it. Um, it's a super solid platform. I don't run a bipod anymore. I do run shooting sticks. And if, if the situation dictates where I could utilize a tripod as a shooting rest versus shooting sticks, I'm going to the tripod. It's more convenient. It's more stable. Um, I probably have it already set up in my little glassing nest. So they have this little thing, the TAC Mountain Rifle Rest, that goes on the leg of the tripod as opposed to the head of the tripod, which is where I've been running my rifle rest before. And because I don't have a visual, I'm going to describe it as best I can. Imagine, if you will, three hook and loop um, attachment points that go on the leg. The body of this is made out of like a a heavy-duty nylon, and then it has a simple webbing strap and a what I believe is a spring steel piece to add rigidity rigidity and structure to it it simply deploys out and creates a nice little cradle for your rifle and at first when i was looking at it after i got it i thought yeah okay this isn't going to be as cool as i thought it was and then i was doing a lot of positional shooting practice with it this summer and i had the the regular v rest that i was running on top of my tripod and i had this side by side and i was trying to determine what is the more useful what is the more stable um shooting rest. What I found was with the V yoke on top of my pod, depending on the width of the forend of the gun that I was shooting, I was either, the forend was too wide for the V yoke and I was like high centered, if that makes sense. Sure. And I didn't have phenomenal stability or I would fight for like a, a, a cant position and then I would overdo it and then I would slip. And then if I had a very narrow forend, like my Kimber Mountain Ascent, for instance, it's got this like super teeny narrow forend it goes so deep into the channel and it doesn't meet the sidewalls of the V oak that I could rock that rifle okay. back and forth. The tack mountain rest will close and it'll kind of, I'm going to use the word pinch, but I don't want to inspire pinch. It'll close up and provide some sort of rotational support to the rifle um, more so than the V oak did. And then I also found that having it against the leg of that tripod and where I can grab the leg of the tripod instead of trying to grab my tripod head I have another nice point of contact on that rifle, and it, it reminds me of shooting off of a bench with a mechanical rest when I'm shooting with it. Um, so I thought it was very clever. It's a relatively low-cost item. It weighs next to nothing. It's attached to my tripod leg. It just stays on there. I generally forget I have it until I need it. I didn't get a chance to deploy it in the field um, this year, but it's one of those out of sight, out of mind, intelligent products, though, that I'm just going to keep it on there and just love it the I, whole time. I could see also, Ryan, you know, having not used it, but just the way you're describing it, you know, potential for maybe your, your tripod glassing with your binos, maybe mm-hmm. you got your spotter on your primary thing that mm-hmm. you're using your tripod for, and all of a sudden, boom, opportunity arises. I want to get down and shoot. Maybe the height of where you have that set is the height where you want to be able to do it. You're not having to switch out rest. Sure. You can just drop down and 100%. execute the shot, you know, particularly if the mo, you know, it's, uh, you know, a lot of these scenarios we get in can be fleeting Mm -hmm. right so and it it, i shot from a seated position and i shot from a kneeling position and it was just absolutely rock solid and shot out to 500 meters is the range that we have there um and just practicing with it out there and i thought that was just a super super clever piece of gear um very excited to see that they came to the table with that 
I like. Can I see that sling real quick? Great idea. Ever since you showed that to me, I've been quite intrigued by this guy. I haven't used the rest yet, Ryan, but I'm assuming too that's also really good for shooting on uneven terrain. If you're yeah. shooting extreme uphill, extreme downhill, because yep. you can probably adjust that height yep. a lot. And I feel like that's the challenge that I find myself in a lot. You know, when I'm yeah, I found this in Alaska. Found this in situations in eastern Montana where, like, you get up on something, and the hardest, the hardest part of executing the shot is, you know, dealing with the unevenness of the terrain. Sure. Where something like that takes out that factor for you and gives you a lot more stable uh, shooting position than trying to work off like an angled rock or something like yep, that. Absolutely. And I, rem- I remember the last time I shot off of a bipod, and I'm not knocking bipods. I still I think they're very useful in the right position, in the right place, in the right time. The last time I did shoot off a bipod was on a pronghorn hunt, and it was kind of a sporty shot. But I was on, I was on kind of a. I'm not going to call it a super aggressive slope, but it was long enough and inconvenient enough that the tripod that I, or the, excuse me, the bipod that I do run, even w- with the with one leg extended on the downslope side, I could meet the ground. With the other leg extended, even at the shortest position that it could go, it was too tall, and I had to fold the bipod leg up and then find some rocks. To, to get stable, and I put my glove or my hat, I can't remember which, under the rock, and I'm, I'm looking at them like, well, this is not the answer. Right. And and I fiddled around long enough with that that if it was a moment that was far more fleeting, I'd have been in trouble. Like, I'd have had to come up with a different yeah. position to shoot off of. And and I don't know necessarily that the tripod would have saved the day on that, but I was glassing from that very position where I decided to take the shot. Like, I, I said, okay, I'm going to take this shot. And then I decided to abandon the tripod and try to go to a prone off of a, uh, mm-hmm. a bipod scenario. Yeah. Had I the tack mountain rifle rest, I'd have just deployed it, set the rifle on it, and I would have gone. My tripod was already set up to meet the contour and the terrain. Um, and that would have been, I thought, well, it probably would have worked out about the same as it did. But I, I did recover the antelope, but yeah. it would have been a lot less fussing around. Yeah. But I'm, I'm super intrigued by that, too, because, Ryan, if you think about a yoke, your gun's on there, your movement is like this. Yep. So with that nylon, do you have a little bit more give to lean out a oh, little a bit? And it's, yep. it's keeping it in there as you're turning it, whereas the yoke, it can get a little yep, little, it's, little funky when you're, like, angling it down, angling it up, yep. and losing contact yep. there. Yep. No, it was, it was pretty neat. I was in my backyard with it, and I wanted to see, well, could I shoot, like, high angle with it? So I ran the tripod leg up a little bit, and I'm laying in the prone, and I've got my rifle pointed, not up, but like near 40 degrees, 35 Mm -hmm. degrees, 40 degrees, up, shooting high angle with it. Same thing with low angle. I can get on it, and I can shoot down. That was my question, was how how much give it's got, but that's that's very intriguing now. Is it just like a web material? It is. What is it? So So it's it's just a loop of webbing that's... Yep. Yeah. So we have a component attached to the tripod leg, and then we have um, what what I'm going to call the arm, which is not correct yeah the arm has a piece of what i'm assuming is spring steel sewn into it so it's got some rigidity to it when it deploys there's then a a, a little web uh, uh, that acts as a yoke boop, pops you. out sure the weight of the rifle and the contour of the forend closes it up yeah. to wherever it needs to be and it's just right there gotcha yeah hmm. very clever Good idea piece. i like it yeah i like the sling too here's yeah. the unfortunate a uh, thing so far of everything that everybody's talked about. Luckily, I, I have the InReach Mini already, but I've been adding the each one <laughs> of these making things. making a little shopping list. <laughs> yeah. So this is, uh, maybe we yeah. should do yeah. this. If you're wondering dangerous. what the pauses in dialogue are, that's Mark writing down a shopping list. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but this thing is great too. Like I can see it like, you know, for a lot of folks, um, you might not, you're like, oh, I'm not, you know, seems a little extra maybe for the type of hunting that I do, but I, I could see even just an uh, added layer of security mm-hmm. when you're like, Oh, we're back at, we're yeah. back at camp in the group, but I still have my pack on and then just like, you know, click it in there instead of, you know, potential. Yeah. cause I, I think if, if you've run a sling long enough, you've had it come sliding off your shoulder. Oh, yeah. Oh, the, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. the best yeah. part I like about that sling is like you kind of mentioned, Ryan is you, one clip that your rifle is off the backpack. Yep. Let's say you got to dump the backpack, make the final 30 yard stock, yep. whatever to get over the hill. Now you just got that thing operating as a sling Yep. and it's just right mm-hmm. there. There's yep. no fuss. It's no like middle ground or dealing with an added modification to a sling. Yep. it's built into it and you've got it all the time and and i did that exact same thing on my mule deer hunt i mm-hmm. was out on this big long walkabout in order to get into position i said okay i don't need my pack at this very moment yep. in time time to dump it and i still have my sling had to go a final probably 60 yards to get in position and uh broke the rule don't leave your pack behind but i, I could see it i knew it was there 
Uh, and yeah, it, it, and it attaches to your rifle like every other sling too, which yeah. is a, another thing that I like is there's nothing proprietary about the anchor points. Yep. They're using Grove tech sling swivel attachment points, yep. high quality stuff. Um, it goes into a standard sling swivel stud. I suppose if you wanted to make an amendment to that and you wanted to go with like a QD sling swivel stud, you could just simply swap out the studs, sure. Sure. you know, no yeah. sweat there. Yeah. Um, but I, I, like I said, very, very intelligent product, um, well thought out. And, and I, a lot of times the best products are the ones that address the smallest issues. Definitely. And they nailed it. Yep. They nailed it. So when you have this thing attached, Ryan, does... Does this strap that clicks in the top, does that support the weight of the rifle? Whole does thing. that so this you know, you no longer have this isn't the this part of it isn't carrying the weight. Nope. But this 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 strap attachment yep. and that's really nice. Yep. Yeah. So it's not just a security thing to keep it from sliding off your shoulder. No, it's load bearing too. Yeah, no, yeah. that's really nice. And, and then you can still operate and it took me a little while because it, I mean, it was very different because I knew I had a sling on and maybe I'm thinking about this too much, but it, it took me a little while not to like Conscientiously, like do the old oh, shoulder right, right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. To, to, to make yeah. it hop up, and so yeah. when I when I clipped it in, I'm like bounced up and down. I'm like, okay, it seems it's to be there, staying there. This is expensive. I hope you don't fall off. And then <laughs> uh, walking around with it after probably I don't know 15, 20 minutes of walking around, I thought, no, it's really on there. And then you're free to move your arms yeah. a little bit, and your back settles a little differently because you're kind of oh, it's you're kind of always yeah. subconsciously hiking the right shoulder oh, yeah. up. Yeah, I'm sure yeah. we've all done that. Yeah. Hiked, hiked for hours with that, like, yep. jerking the shoulder to keep or, the rifle on there. Or oftentimes, like, you know, I'm shoving, I'm hiking like this yep. because I've got my thumb under yeah. keeping right. that tension so it doesn't. Yeah. And then you can't scramble, and when you do, then your gun falls off, and it's, <laughs> yes. you know. Lands I, on the rocks. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. 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 If there's an area to add extra insurance, it's probably the rifle. Yeah. So I think that's probably a, a smart choice. So you made a good point there about the, the scrambling and then the, the butt of the rifle coming forward. They do have... Um, like a traditional gun holder or bearer attachment for the bottom part of the rifle. Yep. And I did run it, but I, I felt for what I was looking for, it was kind of redundant. Maybe it's just the way I have my yeah. pack set up. Um, but it when it's clipped in and I have it slung and the way that I have everything tensioned, it pretty much hugs that rifle to my pack on the back side of my belt forward of a pouch. Sure. And so even bending over or like if you were going to do the scramble, I was not concerned with it the butt of my rifle, like the toe of my rifle stock coming forward. And, Interesting. And okay. That was going to be my mm-hmm. question. If you're yeah. like hunched over, climbing up, it's not swinging? Nope. Not not the way I had it set up. But if you did want that extra layer, they have that attachment. And it is on my pack right now. Again, didn't bring it. But poor visual aid here. Um, but it, you can do it. And it, it is still something where if you throw that on there and you clip it on, you can attach everything down at the bottom of, of the mm-hmm. pack at the butt stock level, and you don't have to do it dismounted. The other, the other um, carrier that I was using, I had to dismount my pack, remount my rifle, remount my pack mm-hmm. if I wanted to like permanently attach it, well, semi-permanently attach it to the side of my pack. And that kind of always drove me nuts. It was secure, and then it was fast to deploy, but the the repairing of the pack and rifle and the, the holder was a total pain in the butt. Um, so this, I think, addresses the issues of both systems. Um, you have a sling, you have to kind of pay attention to it. If you have, you know, that gun holder that we're talking about, it doesn't do one part of the equation stellar. Um, and this, I think, is is the, the best answer to that on the market. I like it. Very nice. Yep. I like it a lot. Yep. Rick, it looks like you're bringing us back to the Midwest. Spring is in the air, Mark. You're not you're not excited about that, are you? I'm very excited about turkey season. I'm going to have you do a prediction right now. How many turkeys do you think you're going to kill this year? Six. You didn't even finish the sentence. He's, <laughs> yeah. six. He's being modest. He's already been he didn't finish that it. either. 600. Yeah. <laughs> 600. No, no, it's, it's going to be six. It's going to be six. It's going to be a light year. Okay, what do you uh, what do you got here? It's gonna be a light. So, <laughs> yeah, right. Guy, guy kills more turkeys in a single spring than most people do in a decade. Oh, he's only got a week to hunt this year. Oh, okay. so six. Right. Well, six. He's got an excuse. So, I, I think uh, I, I need to preface this by saying I think one of the first ten minute talks we did was turkey vest versus yep. backpack. 
on that, I dug my heels in on Team Vest. You dug your heels in on Team Backpack. Go back, play the footage. It's there for everybody to watch. Um, <laughs> and I've come full circle to this uh, system, which is a Stone Glacier Avail 2200 backpack and the FHF chest rig with the turkey kit uh, built inside it. So I want to preface this too by, I guess, like my style of turkey hunting is um, – I'm covering a lot of ground, hunting mostly like big, big woods, timbered type areas, not doing a lot of like field style, like field edge type hunting. A lot of it is, you know, a lot of miles walking, you know, just covering ground, calling, trying to get a hot bird that wants to play the game at that time. What I've found is this is a lot easier for me to cover ground um, and, and, and more nimble than, you know, something that just kind of hangs off like your back, your, your, is around your hips. A backpack obviously sits higher on your shoulders, and this pack, this Stone Glacier Avail 2200, has a hip belt into it, which I think is key for, mm-hmm. for this. Um, so I guess I'll start with the pack, and because I, I, the pack kind of dovetails into the logic behind the chest rig. So what I like about the pack is I can bring. I don't bring a lot of stuff with me. Um, kind of the way that I look at it is like I want a decoy again because I'm hunting in the timber. I don't really care about bringing like the you know, biggest, best, most realistic decoy. So what I actually have is a Montana decoy, uh, Jake, which packs down really, really small. And that's under this compression strap on the back. So in that decoy gives me just enough of a visual aid again, hunting in the woods. I don't need something to see this thing from 300 yards away and come burning across a cut cornfield. I need something to see this from 50 and come into 35. Um, I'll say that, like, I actually think that's a pretty I, darn, like, the three-dimensional aspect of that decoy, like, yeah. I, I, I really like that decoy. And it's it's got this, like, textured flocking on it, which right. I really well, like, uh, too. You know, I think that's actually the, I don't want, you know, when I think about turkey decoys, and this is a general statement, but I think a lot of the problem with unrealistic decoys is that flat kind of shine mm-hmm. that they yeah. get to them yeah. and this textured face on this thing i think does an excellent job and again you're talking the difference of 20 30 yards i don't need him to come in and beat this thing up i just want him to be curious enough to you know poke his head out at 35 and make, see you later. make the mistake <laughs> yes exactly yeah. <laughs> so that decoy i actually have intentionally packed behind this uh camo seat um, you can imagine if you didn't have that seat, you've got that red head. I think it's just always best to cover that up with something, and that's what I do with that seat. So the seat, obviously, if I am sitting in one place for a while, I'll just use that seat. Gets you off the ground, off you know wet wet leaves or whatever. Um, the decoy we covered, and then in the backpack, really all I would need beyond that is an added insulation layer if I'm going to be out there for a while. So I'll throw like a really lightweight puffy jacket, not a super heavy down jacket, but like, like an 800 fill down lightweight, Mm -hmm. uh, puffy. And that I'll keep in this main compartment here. Um, in the secondary compartment, I have obviously my steak for the decoy. And then I've got Paul, I've got my inReach Mini in here, even All for right. for the Turkey Woods. Yeah, you know, 100%. again, kind of like I mentioned, you never know. Um, and then I've got a phone charger in there with uh, with a cord as well. Um, so. Basically, all I need the backpack for is carrying those items, plus the puffy jacket, plus maybe some food and water for the day. I can carry the my water on the external part of the, the backpack with the uh, Nalgene holder. And then on the right side, I've just got this little accessory pouch that has a headlamp in it. Yep. Um, one thing that I, I, you know, found myself doing a lot when I was hunting with a turkey vest is I would strike up a bird, I would set up. That bird would come in to 50, 60 yards, and a lot of times, you know, if he's been pressured and he's kind of, you know, getting privy to what's going on, he'll go quiet. So it would require me making a little, like, 5 to 15-yard, like, adjustment. Oh, mm-hmm. So a lot of times what I would end up doing there is, you know, when you're making that final adjustment, you're going to take your turkey vest off because you don't want this big profile on your back going through the woods. You can crawl a little bit better. So I'm going to ha- I'm going to dump this pack anyway obviously i'm sitting there if if you're thinking about that through the how that would apply to a turkey vest as you're leaving that there well now what did you just do you left all your calls everything so you're stuffing your diaphragms in in your mouth or your you know me i suck at diaphragms i run a slight call 
100% of the time. And so I'd be stuffing that slate call in my pocket. And I always hated like having to move without my vest on because then I don't have my slate call on me. So that's where this FHF chest rig comes into play. Um, I can dump this pack, make a little adjustment, and I've still got everything on, on me. So in this pouch, I actually don't have them in here right now, but I would run the Diamondback 832 mm -hmm. binoculars. For, for what I need when it comes to turkey hunting, that is, that's plenty, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and they actually, I don't have it in here, but recently, I think in the last year, they came out with what they call a little bino bucket. Mm -hmm. And that Velcro is in. You'll see in the inside interior here, everything is Velcro. So it's totally modular. Like if I wanted to move my, my slate calls to this left side, I can just do that. Oh, I like that. Yeah. Um, so how I have it set up in here is not the way that it needs to be set up for everybody. Like there's a bunch of different ways. You can look at photos on their website. You know, you've got the, the shell holder. You can move that position for your strikers. You can move that. So it's fully uh, kind of customizable. The other thing that I think is, um, you know, it, we, we kind of talked about it earlier, really small details are what makes a difference on this stuff. If you look at where they stopped the zipper on this, on the, the chest rig, it's, it's just up from the bottom about an inch and mm -hmm. that's intentional so that it doesn't fold all the way down. So I could actually, and I found myself doing it way more than I thought I would, leaving this thing open and walking, you know, so I could have my stuff in there and knowing that my binos aren't falling out, my striker's not falling out and everything is, is, is in here. Um, so I like that a lot because like we mentioned, you know, if you do have to dump your, your pack or, or whatever, you've still got all the things that you need on your person. Um, the hey, turkey. I imagine you could throw a couple shells in there, yep. you know, all the things. Absolutely. Um, you know, there's a zippered pouch here for like your tags and, and stuff like that. Um, I, again, don't run mouth calls, but where I would put mouth calls, I keep a Brillo pad for, you know, keeping the, sure this, the call. Yeah. Yep, exactly. Um, and like I said, this, this, uh, so this is what's called the turkey kit inside of this thing. So as it ships, it'll come without like all the stuff that you see in here. It's just one big dump pouch. So, I mean, you could fit a pair of UHD 1856s in here sideways, not 18s, uh, 10, 1042s, 1050s in here sideways. Like that's how much, just for reference, that's how much space you can put you know, you can keep in this thing. I think you can fit an 18 UHD. Really? Sideways. I suspected. Really? Like looking yeah. at it. Yeah. I, and I, yeah. re I remember when they had dropped this and they were talking about fitment. If you're running large frame binos, yeah. that's what you'd carry. Yeah. Yep. So it, it's oh. it's great for that. Um, but again, it, like it ships with without any of this stuff in there. So you this is the turkey kit. You can also get a, a fishing kit, which sure. I also have. Um, so for me, I don't, the, the fishing that I do is all off a kayak. Um, you know, and I, I hate bringing a tackle box with me. So I've, I have the fishing kit as well, where I'll put like a couple jigs on the, um, they've got a little like hook holder where, you know, I think most people would put like flies, but mm -hmm. not a big fly fisherman, Mark. Well, that's okay. Um, is it Mark? <laughs> yeah. That's a good question. Is it, okay? <laughs> it is okay. You guys think I'm like some sort of fly fishing purist. I yeah. do all <laughs> kinds of fishing. Yeah. I just don't bobber fish for bass. <laughs> but the point is you can add extra kits and I would anticipate that they're probably going to get even more creative with the kits that they put in this thing because it is probably one of the most versatile um, do-it-all pieces of, of gear that I've used in, in the last couple of years. Yeah, I've been stuffing my strikers into my bino harness. Yep. And mm -hmm. I have lost some favored strikers. Not, yeah. not to the level of your favored striker, but... I'm naked without that I, thing. I know, man. And <clears throat> you're powerless. It is. It is. It is the <laughs> luckiest striker. Rick, that's where can, Rick keeps his just, power. Just for fun, can we? No, nah, never mind. We won't go into that. Never mind. I do. I do think it's nice that this will fit a standard Snickers bar. Up yeah, front. definitely. So Snickers at the ready. Yep, Snickers at the ready. Wind checker if you're getting super technical. Um. <laughs> you, do you, do you, so that's a pro tip. Wind check for turkeys. Win, win, no, no, <laughs> no wind checker needed. Um, but yeah, and then Molly on the front too, so you can run a, um, 
like let's say you wanted to bring something like a box call they have yeah. their uh their gps uh sure. like holder mm-hmm. and that gps holder you could put on the front here if you were like dead set hey I, like my box call is my thing you know yeah, yeah. You could run that on the front, still bring your box call, fit your slate call, your mouth calls in there, and truly have everything that you would put into a turkey vest in an area the size of a six by eight inch, you know, pouch that lives on your chest. You're already going to have stuff on your chest. Yep. Um, this, to me, it, it, it checks a lot of boxes. Yeah. I, I love this thing. I like that thing a lot. If you, uh, let's say you're successful, Eric, which, oh, good which you question. generally are. What's yeah. up? What's your system uh, with that Stone Glacier pack? So there? as soon as oh, a little spill. <laughs> as soon as you know, like you would end up shooting something. What I'm actually going to do again, kind of like we we mentioned, at the very most, what I'm going to have on the interior of this backpack is a puffy jacket, and um, you know maybe some extra food. Right. So I still have room to put these items, the small decoy and the the seating pad, inside the main part of the bag, right. even with that other stuff, and then the 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 bird is just going to sit right in here, cinch it up, and take it out on your back. You don't have to worry about holding the, the you know, the feet up. Mm. Um, you know, which well, is particularly the birds that you and I shoot with those just big, long, dagger-like spurs. <laughs> That'll get right into you. your hands. <laughs> yeah. And no, I, I'm the, soft. The other thing I didn't mention with this backpack, too, is so it only weighs three pounds. Um, it, it has an internal... Uh, like rigid, I wouldn't call it a frame, but it is, it is rigid. Okay. But the nice thing with this is let's say like, if you do have a stone glacier pack, um, you can pop this off this internal frame and actually put it on an X curve frame or the, uh, the, the crux Evo, any of the, the stone glacier frames, this, the pack will actually pop off this thing, go onto the frame. So where I'm going with that is let's say you're a guy that likes saddle hunting, you know, for whitetails. This is a perfect pack to do that and then pack a deer out too if you find yourself oh, in sure. that situation. So it, it's a it's a good size. You know, you can put a lot. It's it's just enough for day hunting to bring like everything you need and nothing you don't. Yeah. Um, I, I like it a lot. It also fits, given the, like the size of this thing, it fits in the uh, rear drawers of like the deck system that I have in the back of my truck. So come, you know, the first day of turkey season, I'll be keeping this thing in the the deck system and i'll have that in there from april 11th until may 31st yeah and i'm always ready to go ready to roll yep i love having kits built where you know when you grab it you got what you need yep and it looks like that's exactly what you have Mm -hmm. here definitely Tried to find the Coach Klein playbook on how to kill turkeys in here, but I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see it. Uh, we can talk about that at a later date. Okay. <laughs> Just a bunch of corn dust in there. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, it's like, what are these corn kernels? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yep. We should we should have played a joke on Eric and just loaded that thing With up. So the seed. secret to my turkey hunting <laughs> just spills out everywhere. Uh, now is Ryan supposed to have all those strikers in his pocket? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like you lost another one. Shoot. Lucky striker. There's one striker in there that that, that does the deed. The other one is isn't that funny? Just for looks. Yep. Uh, Showpiece. So I've had yeah. many different slates over the years, and I upgrade the slates. The striker, for whatever reason, yeah. I believe is the key to success. The really funny part about that striker, not. To totally derail but that striker i bought um when i was in college from like uh i i I bought that call and striker i guess from the cabela's when they used to have the cabela the bargain cave or whatever oh sure yeah it was one that somebody had like must have bought that call and like i mean dumped water on it or something because it was like was it a slate slate or a crystal slate slate. yeah and it looked it looked horrible i bought that whole thing for like four dollars yep um, cause I really wanted the Cabela's, I forget what it was, like the E EGS, whatever, like SLT slate. That's what it was. The Cabela's okay. SLT slate call. I really thought that was a sweet call at the time. So I bought one for like four bucks in the bargain cave. I resurfaced that thing. And then through sanding the tip of the striker, I actually like did more damage to it than good. And I kind of like made an oblong, like, uh, almost like a hook, if you will, off the end of that striker. And I swear that's the reason that that thing sounds good. So I make a directional mark on my striker this end forward, like yeah. point towards enemy. Yep. Because if I hold that wrong, like yep. I can't get the notes that that's I want. A, that's this thing. Yep. And so I, your striker is like a proverbial claymore mine. Yeah. 
Yeah, correct. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. My, got, mine is so prominent that you can actually see it. Like yeah. you don't even need to <laughs> put a, a mark on it. It's <laughs> that. It's that noticeable. So. There you go. That's my turkey setup. Mm, yeah. All right. I like that. Very nice. I like that. Pro tip: remember wind checkers for turkeys. Yep. Oh. I'm gonna write that down too. Yep. Um, is this me? This is you, Mark. Up. Uh, well, in classic Mark fashion, I couldn't decide on one thing, so I brought a bunch of things as per usual. But there's so many good things. I, I was thinking throughout this podcast, Ryan. Like I know you're like, oh, I didn't bring this, but I want to talk about it. We might have to do another one of these, or maybe even do some of these with like different folks at Vortex. I mean, everybody had a season. You know, everybody found like that oh, yeah. one thing. So I don't mm-hmm. know. Maybe, yeah. maybe we'll do some more. Comment below if you're if you're liking this and want to hear about mm-hmm. more gear. I love gear. So. Um, first up on the docket for me is the, uh, Stealthy Hunter glassing pad. And you might say to yourself, well, yeah, seat pad. That's like not new technology. Yeah. Um, I love this thing. I started using it later in the season. Um, it's lightweight, 6.5 ounces, durable, a Cordura, um, you know, fabric on the outside. Um, it's pretty rigid, you know, but it's kind of like that, that to me, it's got like that perfect amount of flex to where it's going to contour, to what you're sitting on, but it's still, I guess I, I like the rigidity of it. Um, you can uh, you can fold it up, use it as a rear bag, you know, if you want a support for your elbow. Uh, it's got, um, I guess you could call this webbing on the outside. Mm-hmm. So, you know, if you want to make sure, you know, if you want to, um, you know, tether it to your pack or run one of your pack straps to it, um, you can do that. I find I've been running it with the, um, the Stone Glacier, Stone Glacier Evo 6900, and just with the two rear straps, I'm, I wasn't even um, running it through here. Like, I was just tensioning Going that down. And it's, like, I guess, you know, soft enough that it kind of cinches in on it. So, like, I was never like, oh, I think I might that might fall out. Like, it never fell out, never budged. Um, the other thing I really like is, as you can see. I was it, just going to bring that up. It's got this blaze orange side to it. Um I like that for a variety of reasons. Now, I, did, I, didn't, I didn't do the, uh, I haven't calculated, I guess, the square inches. Maybe it says on the website, you know, how many inches of blaze. But, uh, you know, if you have a backpack on mm-hmm. and you're wearing a hunting vest, you know, this kind of, when you have it facing out on your pack, kind of serves that purpose of being able to, you know, be more visible from, uh, from the backside. Like I said, I haven't calculated the square inches to know in states where they're pretty particular about that. Right. Like, if is, you're, is if that you're hitting qualify? the legal minimum of... Um, so do your own math on that. Check the regs. Do your own math on that. Uh, packing an animal out, I like, because, you know, you got horns on your head. Boom, you strapped out to the back. You're no longer sitting on it because you are packing out an animal because you were successful. So you got that extra layer of security with the with the blaze on your back when you're, when you're packing uh, a load of meat and some horns out. Um, and I like it for... I haven't had to use it for this, but I've used like an orange hat for this application. Um, maybe you're trying to signal somebody in, yep. you know, they're on a stock or something like that. Uh, um, or you're, uh, you know, trying to spot your partner from far away. Um, you can just, you know, you hold that up. Might You might even get you out of a pinch if you need to, you know, get somebody's attention. So uh, really multi-purpose, actually. Like I said, it seems like, oh, it's a seat. It's a sit pad. Can but I it's see a it? lot more than that. I. Sorry, would you mind handing me one of those um, trekking poles? I just Uh-oh. noticed something. Yes, I thought go. the same thing, Ryan. <clears throat> Not okay. only, you know, Mark talks about the merits of multi-purpose, but it makes a decent shield. So if you get into some sort of combat, <laughs> you thought the same thing. <laughs> The gears were turning as soon as I saw that handle on the inside. I mean, it's not it's not terrible. Yeah, we've all been there. That's LARPing. Cool. I'm, po- I'm, podca- I'm podcasting with children. I'm just saying, Cordero's hey. bear proof, right? Yeah. No, I think it's very neat, Mark. Look, it's like Thank a you, it's like a bite pad. If you know, like the, you wear with the canines, you get bit in the arm. The other we thing did, we did that that one day. Well, yeah, hey, yeah. Beats a sharp stick in the eye. The it other does. nice thing with this too is, you know, how many times do you when you're you know working on an animal, you're on like hard rock or something, and your knees are bugging you. Like, just put this under your knees, you're fine. Um, I, that's that's nifty. I do want to see it for real purposes the sit pad for me was something that i was actually resistant to for a while and it almost is akin to the revelation of when i first started using trekking poles 
Yeah. You know, because you don't always want to wear rain gear, and then you're like, ah, it's wet, you know, and then you sit down. You know, it's like, oh, I'll just put this thing down. Or, like you said, it saves your knees, yeah. or, you know, you're hunting in the state with rocky terrain, or or uh, it's just cold out. Like, that, that layer of insulation really makes a big deal. And I think it makes the, the uh, big enough deal to where you might glass for quite a bit longer than if you were just sitting on the cold ground. Oh, yeah. Sure. Yeah, 100%. And then Think all of a sudden, it. now yeah. you are now you are packing that animal out. Yeah. yeah. Think about because a, you had a, a snow pack. hunt. You know, you sit in snow, how much that just sucks life out of you. I, hey, I've been work well in my turkey pack. Big time. <laughs> Mark, I've been, I've been using a really crappy old um, roll-up sleeping pad that I have over the years put holes in and then cut to length so that I can oh, have Oh, sure, a, yep. Mm-hmm. But it, yeah, it's this, exa- exactly the same this thing. This is kind of too. more of a polished option. Let's see that thing, right? I think it's pretty nice. That's, that's a good kit. Well, and, and you've got the, uh, you know, kind of the more earth tone face to it, you know, depending on what you want show, showing. So you kind of have the, the best of both worlds there. Yeah, those straps you'll see are, I mean, those are probably pretty similar to the ones that I have in my pack, but when you cinch them down, you can see mm-hmm. like, see how it grabs it. You know, as Martin would say, it's a real proper kit. It is proper kit. I like it, Marco. We're just going to leave that on that backpack uh, now the rest of the day. Become addition to the turkey kit. Yep, here, you, you get that one. Oh, yeah, this one's good, too. <laughs> this one's good, too. <laughs> oh, you know what? I'll say another thing. So this is probably a personal preference thing. But I don't love ground seats that are thick because I always feel like I want to, like, roll off the darn mm-hmm. thing. Yeah. Um, so I feel like that's just, like, real nice, real nice thickness. Yeah. And I... Yeah, you'll have to get I, yourself one. Yeah, those are pretty... <laughs> they're, they're pretty cool. You're going to like it. Um, Thanks. That's real. That's nice. That looks so much better, too. Like, it just looks so much more legit than it did before. Hey, you know what, Rick? You can retire the old muddy now. Yeah. For you, Mark. There you go. Look, we negotiated a trade right here on air. <laughs> Good trade. Isn't really a <laughs> How many cheeks trade. has that thing seen? That, thing <laughs> <laughs> that looks like it's been it's been through it. Yep. It's well well used. You're about to see two more. <laughs> <laughs> is that a is that was that a standalone seat or did no, that used to sit stand. on a tree stand? Yeah. I figured yes. that was uh, modified. Yeah. It's like the one I use right now was uh, cut off of a vest. That I no longer use. Like that's I'm getting one of those hundred yeah. percent after seeing that. I was gonna ask if I sold one. How no, many? you're gonna have to buy one. Oh, right. This yeah. Is mine. That's right. That <laughs> makes that makes even more yep. sense, Eric. It's totally fair. Fair. It's, um it's like one of those white elephant gift swaps. Everybody yeah. g- Eric gave you a pad, you got some, Yeah. Oh good. yeah, so I'm not even done. Or wait, no, because then No, you get the trade. Oh, somebody's gonna steal that from me, guaranteed. Um all right, next up on the docket. Something that, and we probably talked about this before in pr- previous podcast, uh, bears repeating again, and this is, uh, you know, a med kit. So yep. uh, I've just been throughout my life just absolutely rolling the dice, even on some like pretty big remote trips with like n- not even a band aid, right? And it's just, it's stupid, it's irresponsible. Um, and so uh, this one is from North American Rescue. It's got just about everything a person's going to need to get through, you know. Um, you know, hopefully any situation they encounter. I mean, they have much more robust med kits than mm-hmm. this. I mean, that's what they specialize in. You can probably get a kit for, I mean, Paul, I saw one that they had. I, I didn't go into the contents of it, but it was for motorcycle riding, right? Mm-hmm. So sure. they're really sure. catering these kits. I think at the time, this was called like the micro IFAC. It might be called something now, but it's got a tourniquet in it. Um, also, when I originally got it, I opened it up and went through the contents and did like an inventory. But even just thinking about doing this podcast, that's something that I need to do again to remind myself (laughs) what I have in here and make sure I know how to use it. You know, it's been a while since I've even uh, looked at like, uh, what's the tourniquet video? I know we were kind of doing, creating some social content a a while back. And it's like, yeah, "Yeah, maybe I should even like go back and look at that stuff. But um, yeah, tourniquet. And even um, we talked about keeping the inReach close at hand. You know, they make stuff to keep your tourniquet more close at hand um because if you need your tourniquet and you're by yourself you know you might not be digging into your pack to get it um where i keep this though is to me like a a pretty close at hand spot eric do you have can you pull out that um that pull out that you have that that stone glacier pull out that that you have so what i do with mine and i didn't bring my pack to show it but so where a person might keep like their water bladder, like that's actually where I keep this exact yep. size pullout. 
this fits in there. So I know with one zip, it's always at the top of my pack and I just know where it's at all the time. That's where it goes. Um, like the end reach, I move this from pack to pack. So like this has yep. just become a thing, even though it's not like super heavy. It's, it's, it's really not, I mean, for how robust, um, the kit is, it's not super heavy, but it is, I mean, it is a weight penalty, but I think you'll be glad you have it if you need it. So, sure. um, it's just one of those things that I carry with me now. Um, oh, where I was going with the tourniquet though, like that's something that I'm actually considering pulling out and being like, okay, maybe that, maybe I need to store that on my bino harness yeah. as well. Yep. Um, any questions? Let me see the weight of it, Mark. That is a nice kit. That's not that's not bad at all. It's nice. It comes vacuum sealed too, and you get it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which I really like. I, about, could, I could reseal it. I yeah. just haven't. Yeah. Think about a tourniquet and how like critical that piece of gear could be. Right. When you're right. sitting there, like my buddy and I breaking down a mule deer this year. He's holding one leg. I'm cutting. He slips. Leg goes flying. Knife. Whoa. Hey. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like yeah. how quick. Yeah can happen oh that yeah. happens or just somebody you turn around and you're like oh i'm gonna go grab that and then you were going to grab something yeah. else and ha, you know yeah my uh, my dad's really good uh hunting buddy actually put a a havilon into his uh thigh this year working on an elk he's okay he was fine oh but he he uh he had a tourniquet on him um which i think is not the norm i don't think people often have a, a tourniquet sure, no, on them no um and, you know, thank goodness he did. And, I mean, he was by himself on a solo elk hunt in southwest Montana, killed a bull, and put a Havilon in his in his thigh. Thankfully missed all the, you know, Ugh. important hard, yeah. hardware inside. Did he use the tourniquet, though, he just in case? He did use the tourniquet just in case and got out of there. Yep. And was he, and he extracted himself? Yeah, he him? extracted no? himself, yeah. yeah. And, uh, unbelievable. But, I mean, it just does go to show. Like, thankfully, he had a lot working in his favor that he missed, you know, right. femoral artery and all that stuff. Um, but had he actually hit it, he would have been geared up because he did have a tourniquet. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's one of those things that you never think is going to happen to you. He didn't think it was going to happen to him that day, but it did. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, you know, just one of those things to, if, and, and like you said, Mark, not to just echo what you said, but it's one thing to have this in your backpack. It's another thing, like if you're going to put this in your pack, this is weight, this is space. So you might as well know how to use it. So mm -hmm. look up the videos. North American Rescue has a ton of good stuff on there, you know, all over for you to like learn how actually to put this thing into use. So, I mean, if you're going to. If you're going to get it, know how to use it. Yep. See, and, even and it's like, perishable, uh, too, though. Like, I at once was, like, you know, like, before season, like, super dialed on, like, okay, I got yep. my tourniquet, tourniquet game, you know, at least, you know, stronger than it was before I watched a few videos. And, like, now it's, like, towards the end of the season, it's, like, Time for a time for a brush, a little refresher yeah. course. Yeah. yeah, I've seen a lot yeah. of like uh, technical colleges, and I know UW here too offers like a two day wilderness medicine course. Oh wow! Yeah, it seems like that's come on a little bit more lately too, to the point that I definitely want to take one. So mm -hmm. when something happens, I actually know what to do. Mm -hmm. But we should sign up for school together. Who's the injured person? Who gets to? Well, oh, I think you. I think you. If you if you sign up for a class, does that affect your uh, your uh, eligibility? Ooh, that's a good question. We're gonna want to look Mark's into that. Mark's gonna go to the tryouts. He's gonna be a wide receiver this year. I'm on <laughs> IR right <laughs> no now. But we'll get uh, we'll get that figured out. They'll so, say, yeah, "Look for me in the NFL." Um, cool. So I like that one. Here's another one that I'm a big fan of. <laughs> And I like it. Like I'm dumbfounded that you guys are like even. You're, you're. I feel like you've been making fun of me. These are the Catula micro spikes, and I love these things. I've only used them really a couple times. Uh, to me, they're definitely worth the weight of carrying if you're on a hunt where um, you might encounter terrain where you need a little extra grip. So. Um, I think when you go to like the website, most of the time you'll see them being used in like icy type situations, mm -hmm. like winter type stuff. Um, for me, it's just any like mountain type alpine hunt uh, where, uh, like I said, you just need a little extra grip. But uh, they're not like super heavy. I think, you know, a pair comes in at about 11.5 ounces. I should point out that sit pad is 6.5 ounces, I think. Um, but these are coming in at 11.5. Um, so they're basically like, you know, I guess you could say like a mild cramp on. They're just a fit over, fit over design. Um, so they just fit over your boot, kind of like so. Anyway, yeah, you can kind of get the picture there. But just a fit over design. 
Um, easy to deploy, easy to take on and off. Um, the spikes are not so crazy sharp that they're going to, you know, poke a hole in everything they touch. So I, I like that. You know, it comes with this little extra bag to hold them together and provides also like a layer of, you know, protection to where you're not going to poke into stuff. But, I mean, you can see like they're, I describe them as dull but sharp. But um, if you put 150 pounds of man on top of them, they become very <laughs> effective. Yeah. So I'm dig right, right in. I, I, I love these things. They provide to me like a level of purchase um, on slippery terrain that could really, really be um, a difference maker. When we were in Alaska, I went, you know, we kind of took the same route a couple different times uh, in that same spot where I wished I had my, uh, that Whippet ski pole deployed. I wish I would have had uh, these out uh but uh we we're kind of scooting along you know kind of time was of of the essence but um going up and down that hill i noticed a distinct difference between when i had these on and when i didn't and my confidence level was like through the roof um i was even walking behind eric and actually yeah. consciously like i'd see some spots where you would slip where it got muddy because we were about you know fourth fifth in line and i'd step in that exact same spot press down, get a good bite and just yep. like go right up. And so the other thing that I really liked about it, I felt like I was actually expending a lot less energy because I wasn't having to be kind of like that middle ground of tentative yeah. with my step where you want to press in, but you don't want to press in so hard that you, you know, that you slip hard. Mm -hmm. uh, and so like, I felt like it was saving me, um, you know, gave me more security and, and uh, expending less energy. So um, yeah, on a hunt like that, I'm just, I'm not going to um, go without these. I've, I've seen, um, there's a guy, and he does like a lot of like mountaineering style type hunting. And I know he's not necessarily a fan of these, but I think he's using like crampon type devices, like, like more of like, this is what I'm wearing the entire hunt versus like, this is, uh, you know, like, eh, I'm going to put these on in this spot sort of right. thing. Right, right. Just for people that might not be familiar, too. Oh, yeah, that, Eric, show, uh, show, the, throw show, them the, on up show the class here. Yeah. Show us yeah. your feet. There we yeah. go. Oh, just like your website. It's like... <laughs> <laughs> and we're back. <laughs> go ahead, Rick. <laughs> so, I mean, for Mark, for people that might not be familiar with something like this, you know, there's, there's crampons, there's micro spikes, and then you even hear, you know, something like the yak tracks talked about like what is the application for each like what where, where, where is there like where is each ideally suited i mean paul you might be able to speak to this a little bit more than i have you know i did like a bit of research and i'm like yep this fits the type of stuff where i'm gonna find myself like a, a cramp on i would think would be uh like a true cramp on would be like yeah. more like i mean that's mountain gonna, yeah. snow where right. you're really kick stepping yeah. in and things like yeah. that generally i mean you're talking something with longer spikes on it that mm -hmm. like you, you know you can see on those you could you could easily walk over any sort of normal train with those they're not going to bother mm -hmm. you but generally crampons are deeper longer spikes and they're going to be used on ice and snow pretty much as the mm -hmm. you know the main thing you know you guys know about alaska i mean one of the things in alaska is there's a plant up there called pushki which i forget it's related to the plant down here that you can get sunburns from the so that's the one that like they would call like celery big, up there yeah great whatever. great big leaves and you know what happens in the fall is that stuff dies off ends up lying on the ground hmm. and gets frozen and it gets extremely slippery you know and that's that's exactly the kind of thing you'd need whereas like a crampon would be kind of overkill for that i mean big long mm -hmm. spikes you're going to be stepping on rocks and stuff not so good but that's def you know that's a nice middle ground that kind of falls in between the you know the 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 Yak tracks and a full on cramp on. Mm -hmm. So, no, and they're easy to carry. And I, I think it's a very worthwhile thing to have. Yeah. And, and, you know, in a pinch, you definitely, you know, you can imagine if you had to cross an icy surface, that's a whole lot better than yeah. just a, a boot tread, you know. I use my Catula micro spikes when I snow blow my driveway. That's a smart move. Because <laughs> you've, you've been up my driveway. It's quite steep. Mm -hmm. And uh, right now it's covered in like four inches of ice. <laughs> And so I, I put the, the micro spikes on. and just That is a good idea. Oh, I'm thinking about so. ice fishing, too. Oh, I was, yeah. was going to bring that up, too. Perfect. You know, early ice, when you before it's snow-covered, yep. something like this is, is a game changer. And I've rucked with mine on, on uh, like Gibraltar, um, on that route, which is pretty wild. Uh, on the 
ascend side of it. And it gets icy in the winter. And when I put them on, I just wanted to see what it was like to have them underfoot with a load on. And I really did not notice them. Like I didn't get any high center spots on the boot and it didn't feel like I was rocking weird. Hmm. Um, and it didn't feel like it encumbered me really at all, um, considering the train. But they're they're super cool. Hmm. Very, very nice product. These are these are another thing. I know you can only keep so many things like in your main pockets, like close at hand, but I also think they're it's also something you want to keep in that department just because when you get to that spot, you don't want to be like, oh, now i got to take my pack off and dig through my pack and find these things. It's like, nope, I keep these in this pocket. Yeah. And when you need them, you're going to need them. Sure. And so, you don't want to be digging through you, a bunch of stuff. Yep. Um, they come in different sizes, too. So for reference, like the boots that I was running, the boots that I run most of the time, um, golly, I'd say, you know, July through you know, the good part of, good part of November is the, uh, the crispy Laponias. I wear a size 10 and a half and the medium fits perfect on that. Boot. Yeah. So that's like a, I guess a, a focus group of one point of reference. Yeah. Um, and then I've got a set of larges that I will fit like, you know, large, like more like late season, sure. type, yep. a little late season leather boot. But, um, no, I, I, I love them like on a mountain hunt. Like I would not, that, that would be, I'd put, I'd rank those with my trekking poles. I like it. I love them. Yeah, and that sort of thing, I mean, generally you can, you know, you can look at your hunt in advance roughly and get an idea of the season and location and where you're at and if you're likely to encounter ice, slippery, wet vegetation, that type of stuff. So, mm -hmm. I mean, you can kind of make that call before the hunt, I would think, generally. And, you know, there's certainly plenty of hunts in the lower 48 here, early season hunts, where you probably would never need that. For but sure. You, you can sort of see that need in advance. And, you yeah, know, either, either take them or not. Late yep. hunts, you bring them along, yeah. Yeah. Would those have been useful on your mountain goat hunt? No, that was an early hunt. You know, there really wasn't much ice or snow on that. It was a lot of rock and wet rock, but not nothing that a, a spike would have helped on. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah, that's the one thing with, I've never used these in rocky terrain. Like, it's always like, um, I don't even know what to call it. Almost like, just like that mountain tundra-y type stuff. Or when we were going up and down, we were going through like a lot of... Um, you know, very steep, like, you know, salmonberry type stuff. But then once we got a trail beat down, it's mud. it was mud. Yeah, yeah. The other thing that's like, honestly surprises me with these things is how easy they actually are to take on and off, yeah. you know, like sitting here, just popped them off, popped them on sitting in a, you know, kind of an awkward high stool. I mean, if there, it's, it's way less cumbersome than I guess I anticipated, anticipated them to be. So like I equate them like really too. like, I'm, we're kind of joking about four wheel drive the other day, but like, you know, you're driving through, you're like, eh, I don't like this spot. I'm going to put yeah. it in four, you know. Um, other thing I like that I have at the table is actually this uh, Stone Glacier Chinook hoodie that I'm wearing today that yeah. I basically wear every day and on the weekends. I, you, you look nice in I it. I love this thing. Mm -hmm. I love the way it, I love the way it fits. I love the way that it feels. It's great for hunting. You can wear it to work. Mm -hmm. Perfect. I think you um, have that in two colors, don't you? I do. Yeah. I'm actually, like, and I can tell you this, it's actually, like, quite durable because I've washed this thing, like, a lot of times because I wear it a lot. Yeah. And, like, it's, uh, it's going strong. It's looking yeah. good. Yeah. It's looking good. I like the pocket location, too, actually. We were, I was going to we ask. Were, we were concerned about that at first. When yes. We saw it. That was, a. Uh, well, I, I wanted you, I'm glad you brought up the pocket. Talk about that a little bit. I mean, I just like it because it doesn't interfere, like, if you're wearing a backpack or something like that, you know, your backpack straps come over. So, if you have, like, an upper left chest pocket. Yeah. Um, you know, you might not want it. It might cover access or maybe you don't want to have whatever item is in there making contact. So, yeah. And I don't use it for a lot of things, but like, even if we're just like doing something, I'll be like, oh, I'll throw my keys right there yeah. or something Chapstick like that. Chapstick or, or something, yeah. something light. Yeah. Yeah. But this thing's, this thing's money though. Like I love the weight. Yeah. Like it's just like a, it's a good all around. So. Very nice. Covered my, a lot of ground nice. here, Marco. And my human gear cap that I inadvertently brought as well today because I really like this for <laughs> it my sounds so algae. trivial, but I've fallen in love with that cap. I, I can't even explain why. It's crazy. <laughs> I like it because you can fill the bottle. Like, you know, I'm always worried about Giardia and things like that. <laughs> um, not at work. <laughs> Of course, I haven't personally <laughs> tested the water. 
I'm allergic to tap water. <laughs> but you can uh, you can comment d- below if you two are you can, afraid of Giardia. You can dip your bottle, you know, use your steri pen or however you're gonna purify your water and like you know, you always have that residual that's on the lip. You're like well, is that where the Jerry is? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, and then you just uh, screw this guy back on, and then you uh, would a pathologist please d- comment below with how concerned we should be with Jerry? <laughs> I've had, and I've had Jerry at work. And then you, uh, was it because of the cap? Water? It wasn't. Oh. I was drinking out of uh, stagnant water in the ditch as a child. Contracted Giardia. <laughs> Makes a little more more sense. Some good stuff on the table here, Marco. Lots of good stuff. And, uh, yeah, I'm glad we had this talk because I'm going to make some additions, yeah. actually. It's always, I mean, gear is like, it's awesome and it's just, it's good. It's fun to fiddle with and, oh, of course. Yeah. you know, modify your kit and do things like we're doing where you're looking back on the previous year and like, oh, what could I tweak or yeah. what could I get or, you know. I think this is yeah. like, this is the time to be doing it too. Mm-hmm. You know, you don't want to start trying to th- remember last season in July, you know, when you're on the, the front right. end of, you know, the next fall. So, I mean, like, like what I, what I did this year is like specifically for, uh, for bow hunting. Like I just, if, if there was something like that, I did it with my backpack that I liked a little different. I'd just drop a note in, in my phone. Oh, just smart. keep a note of that. Um, that's remarkably organized. Yes. My it, problem is I usually like, okay, antelope season starts October 15th, mm-hmm. about October 7th. I'm like, I should probably start getting ready for this. And yep. Like, oh God. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yep. And then you're antelope hunting going, oh, I remember when I was going to make that change yeah. last year. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but no, like you said, Eric, covered a lot of ground here, some good stuff. This is the time to be thinking about it. I'd be curious what the listeners, uh, you know, what their new kit looks like yeah, or changes, changes. Let us know. Yeah, changes they're making or stuff they added or that they found that worked. And also, if, if you like this podcast and you want to see other, like, new gear type podcasts yeah. or even just gear related stuff. Um, Are I you mean, guys, heck, I brought this stuff. This isn't even all the right. stuff that I really like this Definitely. year. You know? Are you guys going to link to all this stuff somewhere? Yep. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. All this stuff will be linked in the uh, description on YouTube. Um, yeah. And if there's a certain piece that someone finds that they're like, hey, I want to, you know, we kind of, well, you got an hour and a half to glaze over a lot of stuff. If there's something that, you know, someone specifically wants to really dig into, you know, drop that below too, and we can always do that. Sure. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks everybody for listening. And, uh, yeah, let us know. Until next time, happy hunting and shooting. And, uh, man, I can't believe we got another one in the old uh, gear view mirror. <sighs> Good, he's good. You, you can't, you can't beat it. Golly, Bazooka Joe and Laffy Taffy does not have anything on him. No. Golly, did we sign off? See you next oh, year. See yeah. Yeah. Next time. Bye. There you have it, folks. Thank you very much for listening. As usual, give this video a like if you liked it. Comment something below and give us a subscribe to the Vortex Nation podcast channel. It would mean a lot to us. Also, why don't you give us a follow over on Instagram while you're at it, at Vortex Nation Podcast. We'd love to hear from you over there, and we'll keep you updated with all kinds of cool photos and videos from our adventures that we do here. Otherwise, we will see you on the next one. Thank you again. Happy hunting and shooting, everybody. Have a good one.